Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Well, welcome, welcome. Uh, if you're with us in person or if you're here with our first live stream, welcome. We're glad to be with you this morning uh, to worship God together. Hey, I want to give us a moment. Um, gosh, it seems like we have more energy, like we have that extra hour, right? The thing is paid off. Why don't we do this? Why don't we look around and just greet the people next to us, give us a wave, a little COVID wave, just saying hi, find a way to connect. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, good morning again, and welcome. We're so glad to be with you here. Uh, we're actually going uh, through this series of uh, the armor of God. We're going to continue it on, and today we're going to talk about the shield of faith and remembering that we all kind of put our faith into something to protect us, uh, and uh, faith that we, we, we lean on and we, we, we hope for, right? Um, I'm reminded of this uh, this last uh, week, I feel like I've never been so popular because my phone number is on some special list for every single political thing that can happen and all the propositions. It's just blowing up all the time. But again, with hopes of and dreams of, of something to happen and what a good reminder it is for all of us to be together this morning and be reminded that it is God that we find our ultimate hope in. It's in him that we have faith because he is one that endures and is with us at all times. And so we're reminded of that uh, this morning. And so for our call to worship this morning, I want to invite you to read with me. It's from Lamentations chapter 3, 24 through 25. And why don't we read that uh, together? And this is God's word. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you that you are good, that you are our portion, and that you are our inheritance. You're the one that we can lean on. And when we talk about faith and where we put our faith, we, we know that we can trust fully on you. And it's so easy to forget that. It's so easy to drift. And so we pray, Lord, as we, as we uh, come before you this morning, Lord, that you would just open our hearts, that you would uh, provide a way to, 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 to speak to us, to be the anchor to our soul, uh, that we may be able to rely on you for everything. So we give you this time this morning. We thank you that you've called us here by name, and we, 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 we love you. We pray all these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with all of you. Good to be with all of you at home for our first live stream. Um, why don't we sing together here at home and around the world. Let's worship our Lord together. Stop. 
thank you for um, this reminder. We pray that this would be our prayer, that we would trust you in the lowest valleys um, when our hearts are heavy. Um, Lord, especially in this season um, of of feeling isolated and feeling lonely, we ask that you would would be with us, that we would lean on you and your spirit would comfort us. Um, Be with us, Lord, right now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. I want to welcome you all to Redeemer, for those of you who are in person here, as well as those who are online. We're so glad you're able to join us. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at this church. And if you'd like to find out more information about Redeemer, can I invite you to fill out one of our Connect cards? You can do so electronically online, and we will personally follow up with you. There's so many different ways to get connected and be in community. And one of the things that you can do to find out what's going on in the life of our church is encourage you to subscribe to our e-news to get a weekly update in terms of all the different activities from children, students, college, young adult, our whole church family, what's going on. So let's continue to be that church family that connects and serves and loves one another. At this time, I want to honor one particular person today, and that's Amy Joseph. I'd like to ask her to come on up to the front here. Yes. All right. Amy Joseph, many of you know who has been our amazing women's ministry director. And this month, she's going to be transitioning from being our women's ministry director to focus in on raising her boys as well as coming alongside Gijo in support for campus outreach ministry. And so today, I just want to take a moment to just honor and give thanks to Amy. We're going to do the clapping again at the end as well. But just, uh, I want to say a couple of words to you, Amy, on behalf of everyone here. How grateful we are on behalf of our leadership, our whole church family. What a gift you have been. And I shared this to you personally before. You have such amazing gifts from, as a prophet, priest, and king. You, your prophetic gifts, you're an incredible student of God's word. You bring it to life. You make it memorable. All of us, including myself, have learned under your teaching. Your priestly gifts, the way that you care for people authentically, the words that you say, the the love that you show is so evident. And your kingly gifts to raise up leaders, to raise up people who are disciples. It's been amazing. And as God has given you all these gifts, I know that he'll continue to use those gifts to bring encouragement to people, to our church family, and to around the world. So just, I want to again express my heartfelt appreciation for the ways you have poured out yourself to our church family, and we are so grateful for you, and you have just created this incredible foundation upon which our women's ministry can build, and our whole church is more healthy because of the ways that God has used you. So thank you so much. On behalf of our church, we want to give you these flowers and this card. And uh, again, we love you. And I'm going to pray for Amy. Then afterwards, let's all clap and cheer and make her feel very awkward while we do that. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much, Lord. Um, I think about the body of Christ. Jesus, you are the head of the church. You have given all these different members different gifts to edify, to build up one another. And it is a great privilege for me today to acknowledge and give thanks for for Amy Joseph. Thank you for the ways in which you have used her to build up the body here, from the women to our entire church family. What a great blessing she has been. And Lord, I just pray that in this next season, you would continue to fill her with joy and strength. Thank you that their family is here and not going anywhere, and they're going to continue to serve and faithfully and build up the body of Christ. But in this new season, I pray that she would find just great joy in not having to do anything but to be as a daughter of God. 
And out of that would overflow life-giving um, love to her husband, to her boys, and to everyone else around her. We thank you for your kindness and your goodness to our church manifested in a moment like this today by giving us uh, Amy as an incredible gift to build up our church. Thank you. You are faithful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we appreciate Amy? Thank you. All right. So once again, I want to welcome you here. And we've been, for the past several weeks, going through a sermon series called The Armor of God. And the reason why that's so important is existentially, relationally, nationally, globally, you look at what's going on in the news, there's this, this tension that we experience and see everywhere. So what do we do about that? And Christianity says that when you put your hope, your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, what happens, our passage that we're going to read in just a moment, the Apostle Paul says, every resource has been given to you to live out and stand firm in the Lord in light of all the tension and battle that you're witnessing and feeling. So what that means is if you're struggling with loneliness and in this season, you just feel like it's sliding into greater, greater in isolation, despair, and depression. If you're struggling with cynicism, as you look at what's going on, everything is colored negatively. If uh, you're angry and, and the anger is moving to a place of hurting yourself or others around you, if you're dealing with rejection and failure, how to prevent it from just getting lodged into your heart? How do you get success and the pride from getting into your head? All those different things, our series is saying, God has given you every resource, pull it out. Live it by faith. It's made available to you. So up to this point, we've looked at the metaphors, specific armor pieces that uh, the Apostle Paul addresses. We looked at the belt of truth. We've considered the breastplate of righteousness. We looked at the gospel shoes, the gospel Air Jordans I mentioned last week, the readiness of the gospel of, of peace. And today we're going to look at the shield of faith. And so if you have your Bibles, if you have your Bible app, it's also up here on the screen. I'm going to be reading from Ephesians chapter 6 from verse, verses 14 to 18. Let me read it for us. This is God's word. Let's listen to his word and what it has to say. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Verse 16, this is the one we're going to look at. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So this is God's word. So today, we're going to look at the shield of faith in three thoughts. One, why we need a shield. Two, why we need this shield of faith. And three, how it protects us. So let's look at the first one, and that is why we need a shield. So when Paul uses this imagery of a Roman soldier and the armor pieces, he has a Roman soldier in mind. We tend to think of S.H.I.E.L.D. in light of the movies that we've seen. Captain America, Wonder Woman, there's this round shield that's really tough and you can throw it around and it comes back to you and you can knock people out and do all that. That is not the, the, the idea that the Apostle Paul had in mind. In fact, with the Roman soldiers, this shield that they used was about two and a half feet wide and almost five feet high. It was literally a door shield. And what's important to know is that it was used in specific moments in the battle. Not 24-7, because you can't lug this thing around with you everywhere. It was used in particular instances. One of the things to note in our reading in verse 14, in the ESV version that I just read, it says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. And the word in all circumstances, I, don't, I actually don't think that's a good translation. Because, of course, in all circumstances, on one hand, Christians, we live out our faith. But the King James Version says, above all, take up the shield. And that's not a good translation either, because above all means and implies that the first three we looked at, the belt of truth, the righteousness plate, and the shoes, you know, that's important. But now, above all, it's going to be this one. That's not what he's saying. The NIV actually, I think, got it right here. And it says, in addition to all of this. So in addition to these, now he mentions, now take up on this one. I, I mention that because this particular shield, in light of the Roman soldiers, was used in two, two specific ways. Let me highlight for you. First, 
It was used when the enemy started hurling these arrows, fiery darts at you, and these shields had a metal coating that would quench it and prevent it from bursting into flames. But it was used when the battle was preliminary before it got personal. Before you fought with swords, before it was in your face, it was used from a distance. You know it's coming at you. That was one way it was used. The second way that it was used was when the enemy, for example, let's say has taken a bunch of your loved ones and your people captive and are, 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 are in prison in a fortress. And so what you would do with your army is you would go and storm the fortress. You would attack it to rescue your people. And as you got closer to the fortress castle, that's when all the arrows would come at you. And that's when you needed that shield for protection in place. I mention that because some of you right now looking at this week, your stomach is dropping. You're starting to see the arrows come, but it's not personal yet. It's that doctor's appointment or that phone call from the doctor that you're going to get. It's conversing and following up with the, that, that relationship that feels very tense. It's dealing with this week with the, with the voting and the results. You feel very anxious. You see something's coming, or maybe it's an exam that you're going to be taking, and you feel very fearful and unsettled. You see it's coming. That moment, you need a shield. Or others of you, right now, you are in the thick of the battle. You are engaging. You're not being passive. You're pushing in, and that's when you feel the assaults and the attacks coming your way. One of the things I've noticed is that when you read the biographies of Christian men and women in the past, that when they take their faith seriously, all these spiritual attacks and hardship come upon you. That's been true of what biographies have said. That's been true of many of the experience of, of Christians here. That means if you're saying, I want to follow Jesus. I'm going to take a step forward. I'm going to make a stand. And in doing so, you're feeling the attacks coming your way in so many different levels. Why? Well, one commentary said, of course, if you're going to engage, if, if you're storming the castle, you're right there. You're a threat. The attacks will come. If you're like one mile off, why would anyone throw any darts at you? So maybe some of you are pressing into your faith. You want to live it out, and you're feeling the attacks. That is also when you need a shield. Take notice that in verse 16, Paul says the phrase, take up the shield of faith. Prior to this, he used put on. You put on, and now he says take up. There's a difference here. When you put on the belt of truth, you put on the breastplate of righteousness, you put on your sandals, you put it on, and it stays with you. Whether you are in your tent sleeping, fighting for getting ready for battle, or when you are in the battle, you never take it off. But when he says to take up this shield, you don't carry that thing with you all the time, nor the future helmet of salvation will look at or the sword. You have to pick it up, take it upon you, and get ready for the battle in place. That means in these moments when you look ahead and the arrows are flying, in this moment when it's chaos and it's crazy for you, you got to take up this shield of faith. Let me give you some practical thoughts of what that means. For some of you, you listen to this and you look at what's happening and there is a temptation to just run the other way, to avoid and go back running the other way saying, no, I don't want any part of this. The problem with avoidance, those of you who are married know this, try avoiding problems in your marriage. That does not address the problem. That does not solve anything. In fact, it only makes things worse. Listen to a couple of comments from people, quotes, Running away from any problem only increases the distance from the solution. Another person said, the avoidance of pain is the beginning of all unhealthy behavior. Because we want to avoid it, it leads to addiction. It leads to using others. It leads to lying and covering up. So if you're avoiding, that's not going to help. And the reality Paul is saying is you're running away. There is an enemy the evil here is not impersonal. It's not abstract. It's a supernatural being. Evil comes from evil actions of people who have been impacted by the fallen humanity because being deceived by an evil supernatural being. And as a result of that, this enemy is faster than you, will chase you down. You can't escape. Others of you are saying, okay, I can't, I'm not going to avoid it. I'm going to go head on. Here we go. Let's push right through. So you're saying, let's fight and let's go on. But if you don't take this a shield of faith with you, listen. Using this imagery, you might be the best fighter with the sword. You might be the quickest and the most agile fighter outrunning anyone else. It doesn't matter in those moments. 
because the darts are coming, you are not protected, it's going to level you out. And so the point here is that the spiritual battle is beyond us. We need the armor of God. We need, to, we need Jesus. But if we try to take it up on our own, we're going to be sunk. And that's why Paul is saying here, in this particular armor piece, you've got to put, in, put on, take up the shield of faith. You need something outside of yourself to provide the, the protection from all these darts that are coming your way. That's the first point. Now let's look at the second one, which is why we need this shield of faith. Why we need this shield, of, uh, this shield, Paul calls it the shield of faith. Now let me say a couple things about this. Biblical faith, what it is not and what it is. First of all, what it is not. What it is not is faith in faith. Biblical faith is not just determinism to think that everything is going to get better, just hold on, stick to it, and everything will eventually make its way through. You see movies that kind of honor that, lift it up. It's not positive vibes. It's not just faith in faith. Some of you have seen this example or heard it before. Let's say a wild animal, a bear, is chasing you in the wintertime, and you're escaping and running out for fear of your life, and you come to a big river, there is ice all over it. To get to safety, you have to cross it through, but the ice is only one inch thick. But you think to yourself, faith in faith. I'm just going to be determined and think positive and happy vibes. I'm going to make my way through. You know it doesn't work. Because it's the object of your faith that matters. You can have great faith as you want. You're going to still sink in. This is not talking about faith in faith. For some of you as Christians, please listen. I'm prone to do this. When hardships are coming, you want to avoid it by slapping on a verse and saying, that's fine. And yet in doing so, there's a lack of vulnerability, a lack of gospel transparency to acknowledge this and put your faith and hope in the Lord. Because that means you are weak and God is strong. One of my mentors said this, that the gospel makes you more human. The gospel makes you more human. Human to acknowledge this battle, I'm getting hit. I'm my, my arm is on fire right now. It's, it's about to burn. I need, Lord, I need you. So it's not faith in yourself, faith in faith. In faith. It's, it's faith in the Lord. Second thing, what it's not, it's not faith as feelings. Feelings are a derivative of faith. It comes forth out of it, but it's not feelings. To my Christian friends, you might say, I just sang that song. I feel like my, I'm so uplifted. I feel like I have great faith. Well, it could be, but it also could be that you had great coffee this morning, <laughs> right? And adrenaline's kicking in. You're like, I feel great. I feel awesome. The reality is the people you're sitting next to, you might go one day, I feel, oh, I feel such love for this person. I want to serve this person. I want to serve my spouse. I want to, you know, I want to serve my, my roommate. Uh, the next moment you might say, I want to punch that person in the nose. I'm so frustrated with that person. You see, your feelings will move back and forth. So faith is not feelings. The third thing what faith is not is not faith in yourself. Irreligious people will say, it is faith in me. At least I'm responsible for it. No one else, I don't need God to help me. It's faith in me. Religious people will say, I am going to put my faith in, 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 in Jesus, but at the end of the day, it's still faith in me. It's up to me to make sure I'm fighting and do that. God is really there to help me in the gaps when I fail. He'll forgive me in, those, in that journey, but really it's up to me. Christians say, it's faith that's not looking at myself, but it's looking outwardly to you, Jesus. And as Christians, me, myself included, there is a temptation to put faith in yourself. When challenges come, I think to myself, I'm a pastor, I know these things. Oh, my theology will hold me through. Oh, I know how to communicate this really well. Oh, hold on. What do I need to do to strategically solve this problem? Because, you know, I, I'm a follower of Jesus. I've been following Jesus for a long time. All those things, for me, is like, is, it's basically fighting without the shield of faith. I am going to get hit. It's not faith in yourself. If that's the case, then what is faith? What it is? Faith, what it is. One, it is belief in God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, uh, faith is believing that God exists and he, he rewards those who, who seek him. Rewarding is not like, hey, follow God and Jesus and all this money will come your way. No, he rewards you with a relationship, a relationship of being a son and daughter of God. He, he rewards as you humbly seek him. So it is an intellectual assent of God, but more than that, with the intellectual assent of God, it is a heart trust in God. It is your life leaning toward and finding your hope in God. In this way, everyone has faith. 
We all put our heart trust into something. That could be a political party. It could be your comfort. It could be economic success. It could be in having a relationship. It could be in being smart. You put your heart trust into something. Biblical faith is an intellectual assent of God, but putting your heart trust, saying, I'm going to lean in on you. Secondly, what it is then, it is that, the object of your faith. It is faith in the Lord. One of the things I've heard people say to me is this. People who, are, who have said, you know, I wish I could believe. I wish I had faith like you, Paul. It, it, it would help so much in this time of hardship. Your faith, I see, upholds you when there's suffering. It holds you, but I can't. I don't have that kind of faith. In one sense, it's sort of a backhanded slap that says, I wish I could have faith with you, but really I'm a rational person. I'm really just a scientific, rational person. It's nice that you have this imaginary, can't be proven God in place. How it helps you, wonderful. Religion can be a great thing. But for me, that just doesn't work for me. The reality is every worldview, including secular modernist thought, philosophy, is a leap of faith. It cannot be proven. Let me give you another example of this. Human rights. One of the things I'm so thankful for is that there's still in our, in our cultural milieu, whether uh, for many people who don't believe in God, who are secular modern people, they say, human rights, we need to care for the poor. We need to think about those who are disenfranchised. We need to do that. But when you have a modern secular view, where does that come from? Many Christian and non-Christian philosophers will say that care and concern comes from vestiges of the Christian thought. Because Christianity will say it comes from because God created everything and God created human beings made in the image of God. Because God loves every human being has value made in the image of God. But if modern secular thought says you stomp over the weak people in doing that, then where's the basis of human rights? And so some will say, whether you believe in God or not, everyone knows, every culture, the majority of people know that we need to care for people. Of course, that should just be accepted. The problem with that is that Human rights is relative. A majority of people saying that, well, great. Isn't human rights not about the majority of people, but the minority? The, those who are disenfranchised, what about them? So the whole point of it all is the argument of human rights from a modern secular view cannot be proven. There's no evidence. There's no rational evidence to it. My point is that we're all living by faith to have some object into it. Christianity says put your faith in the Lord. And as you do that, let me share a couple of verses with you. Faith in the Lord, the passages talk about how God is our shield. What's amazing is in our reading, Paul says, put on the shield of faith. Like, God gives you the shield of faith. Take it up. When you read, especially the Psalms and Proverbs, it says, God is your shield in faith. He doesn't just give you something and throw you out there. He says, I'm going before you. I'm your shield. I'm the one who protects you. I take all the darts on your behalf. I take your judgment. Therefore, you are safe. So let me share with you some of the verses here from, from, from Scripture. Psalm 28, 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. Do you see that? Heart trusts. And I'm helped. My heart exalts. And with my song I give thanks to him. The Lord is my shield. You are the shield. I trust in you. And then do you see the derivative of joy that comes because of your object of faith, your heart trusting in the Lord? A couple of others. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Because he's our shield, you can endure and you could wait when waiting is hard. Proverbs 30, verse 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. The Lord not only gives us a shield of faith that in that metaphor, other metaphors say the Lord is your shield. That's why you and I need a shield. Jesus Christ came into this world, the message of Christianity says, the Lord himself, and as he came into this world to die on the cross, that shield came out. His crucified body stood, and all the flaming darts that was meant for us in this world. All the sin, all the judgment, the wrath of God, everything came right pinpoint centered upon him. And as a result, in him, you are protected and safe. If you're listening to this and you're exploring Christianity, you grew up in the church and you're thinking about that, what that means, Christianity is not 
hey, good people versus bad people. If you're good, then God protects you, and bad people, you're left to your own devices. It's humble people versus proud people. Humility to say, I'm getting hammered. I, I, don't, I don't have the protection in place. I need you, Jesus, to be the one who's my shield to protect and watch over me. So I want to invite you, for some of you, to take up this shield for the first time because every other shield that your heart trusts in is not going to work. If it's going to be comfort, wow, this COVID season has just blown that away. You're burning up, lighting up, you know, on fire everywhere else. If it's about economic security, you might feel like the ups and downs of the market in the midst of it all, but you're fearful. You feel that shield's not going to protect you. But it is this shield, Scripture says, will hold you in place. For those of you who are my Christian friends, remember again to take up the shield. In the midst of the battle and the chaos going on, if you forget to take up this shield, it's coming at you. You have to take up this shield and, and use it against the darts. And let me say one more thing as you take up this shield. One of the other ways in terms of Roman battle was they would connect these shields together. Meaning we need community. You need it, so do I. That the shields have to come together, the gospel community in place against the darts of the evil one. So that's the second thought here, why we need this shield of faith. Now, third and lastly is how it protects us. So how does it protect us? The word fiery darts is significant. It's not only mentioned here in the Bible, but elsewhere, it has particular reference to suffering. It has particular reference to suffering as a follower of Jesus, persecution, suffering, hardship. Let me share with you a couple of texts. In 1 Peter 4.12, the apostle Peter says this, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. And in the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verse 20, there's three young people living under the edict. King Nebuchadnezzar says, everyone needs to bow down and worship this idol, this statue of me. They refuse to, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And when they refuse to, Nebuchadnezzar gets so enraged, it says, you know, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Some of you feel like you're in a burning, fiery furnace right now. The, the things are just slinging your way. You feel that into place. And in the fiery moments that you and I are in, in the suffering and hardship, the shield of faith, how does it protect you? One, you look at the fact that it's Jesus who has protected you from the ultimate uh, fire of judgment and death. And in light of his love, you know that God's not punishing you, therefore he's growing you. So when you, you and I struggle with this, and we're honest with our struggling, the shield of faith reminds us through God's word and his truth that you look to the Lord, and at least three things let me just mention here, that God is your vine dresser, that he is your refiner, and he is your father. He's your vine dresser. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, you know, uh, he talks to this imagery of a vine, and you have to abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. But the, God is a vine dresser who will prune. I am a horrible gardener, but I've seen things that have been pruned, and it looks like a, a fruit plant pruned looks awful. I, they just like cutting things up. It looks painful, but a, a good pruner will never waste a cut always meant not to bring, not just for the purpose of bringing pain to the plant, but to bring about greater fruitfulness. And scripture says, so it is in light of Jesus' death on the cross. He took the ultimate was cut off. You can know that he's pruning you in love. Secondly, he's a refiner. In 1 Peter, Paul, Peter talks about this too. He says, so that our testing of our faith is meant to be proven to be like gold. So it is through refiner's fire that the dross and the impurities are, are burned away so that what comes out is truly beautiful. Now, all of us, I think to some degree, suffering, we don't enjoy it. It's, uh, it's bad, but there is some degree in which suffering um, has some qualities that, that uh, it makes you more empathetic. It makes you more understanding. So we all know that to some degree, but Peter tells us that even through this, your Abba Father who loves you is refining you so that you become more like Jesus. The goal is to become and reflect all that you and I were created to be, to be the most human, to reflect the most perfect human, 
to love God and love neighbor, to become more like Jesus. And thirdly, God is your father. Consider for a moment this uh, illustration, a, a young family, father and mother with young kids who decide to move to San Diego maybe during the season of COVID because of a job. There's a job situation here that's going to be far better. It's going to bring, make, make you don't have to work as much. The pay is going to be better. And uh, your, 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 your parents live here, so there's grandparents that are nearby. So you decide, and it's San Diego, so it's America's finest city. So who wouldn't want to move here? So all these things, and you make this move, and you come to San Diego, and yet your young children are so angry because you have pulled them out from their best friends. All that they had known, their club baseball team, their club soccer team, their best friend, their best neighbors, you've rooted them all away and you've taken them away and you brought them here where they don't know absolutely anyone. And at that moment, as a child, you are so angry at your parent and yet will never, that child will never know the perspective of, 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 a, of a mother or father. My friends, that gap between a young child and that parent is so minimal to the infinite gap of us as children of God to our Abba Father who loves us so. And there are many things that we're not gonna understand. But again, we put up the shield of faith to know that this is our God even as we endure through it. Let me give you another lens to look at this to put up the shield of faith. Jonathan Edwards, when he was 18, he preached his first sermon and it was called Christian Happiness. If you can look it up, it's a really short sermon, but the three points are really powerful. And on Christian happiness, he says these three points. He says, if you are a Christian, he says, you're, you're, um, let me make sure I get it right here. He says, your bad things will turn out for good. Your good things will never be taken away from you. And the best things are yet to come. He says, your bad things will turn out for good. Romans 8, 28. All the, whatever it is in God works, all things for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. That good is not your comfort. God's never about just being suffering free. It's becoming more like Jesus. But your bad things will turn out for good. Your good things will never be taken away from you. What's the good things? Christianity says what really is a good thing is knowing that in Christ you stand justified, that you are adopted as a child of God. That will never be taken away from you. You are a son and daughter of God. You are in Christ. It will never be taken away from you. And third, the best is yet to come. So that in light of all the suffering that's going on here, we see that even death itself will only usher us in into the embrace of our loving Heavenly Father. It will bring us to the, into the person of Jesus of radiant beauty who loved and gave his life for us to be that shield because he loves you and me. So it will usher in to the place of incredible beauty and radiance like we have never even, that we can't even fathom or understand. And so it is when you put up this shield of faith Jesus himself, the truth of his word, when the darts come, it helps bring you protection from those suffering and hardship to give you perspective. But not only that, when you put this on in the gospel, a different arrow pierces your heart. And it's the arrow of his great love and passion. It's the arrow of, it, it, it lights you up on fire to give you courage in the midst of fear, in the midst of suffering hardship. It gives you the boldness of the gospel. It gives you endurance. It gives you the fruit of the spirit. All of this so that you light up in a different way from all the fiery darts so that you become now one who reflects God to this broken world. Yes? Amen? So in bringing this to a close, let me just challenge, and I'm gonna invite us to just a moment of prayer for us, silent prayer. One, that we would put on the armor of God because we so need it. This is a pretty significant week for our country as we have uh, election and voting taking place. There's a lot of fear. Do people are wondering what's going to look. Is there going to be violence or whatnot? Would you pray with me and put on, for my, my brothers and sisters who are Christians, let's put on the armor of God, saying, I need this, we all need it, and put on the shield of, take up the shield of faith. Not only that, let us pray for unity, unity that, that's found in Jesus that we already have, and let's pray against the devil schemes to divide and devour our church, our country. Would you pray with me in that, knowing that the victory is the Lord's? And even now, my friends, it's time to gird up by the work of his spirit. And we do that by praying. Paul even closes it that way too. So with that said, as I ask the music team to come on up, 
Let's spend a moment in silent prayer. Time to gird up, put on the armor pieces of God. Would you pray for unity? Pray against the enemy, the devil's schemes, and I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray. Our God, we come to you, the one who is the pruner, refiner's fire, our Abba Father. We come to you to humbly acknowledge our weakness. We come to acknowledge to you that there is a battle in place that is beyond us. We also come to you in faith, acknowledge that Jesus, you are the one who fought the victory. You won for us, you fought for us, you died for us, and you rose for us. And now you've given us all these armor pieces these resources that you're calling us by faith to employ, to employ. So we want to respond today to take up the shield of faith, to bring to remembrance and to bear and into our practice, into our obedience, all the truths of the gospel, your power, your presence, your divine love, who you are, bring it to bear into our lives and enable us to reflect you in all that we do. Lord, in this particular week, with all the events that are at hand. Lord, the feelings of uncertainty, the fear, the, gosh, from the election to different meetings and the challenges of life. God, we thank you that you are our rock. Lord, we come to you and ask that you would uphold us. We pray for unity. I pray for unity in our church. I pray for unity, Lord, among all followers of Jesus because of the blood of Christ that has united us together. I pray against the enemy's schemes. I pray against the devil's devouring and dividing that there would be your truth and your beauty that would stand forth. And this would be an occasion for your people to stand firm, to put on the armor of God and to take up the armor of God as well. Jesus, our hope is in you. Our strength is in you comfort and light us up with the right fire, the passion of the gospel, love for you and love for neighbor, Lord, today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can I ask you to stand and we're going to close as we sing this song together.
you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life so much for joining us online and for all of you here. We're going to close with a benediction, and the benediction is a reminder to us that his love for you, his covenant love never fails because of Jesus. So may you go forth with that hope and that blessing in mind. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as we head on out,